Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Cardiology Lectures. I am Dr. Nick Nickham, and today we are going to look at ACC AHA Peripheral Arterial Disease Guidelines published in 2016. And at the same time, we are going to do a complete review on the topic of uh, peripheral arterial disease. This would be useful to internists, cardiologists, and also all other professionals such as endovascular surgeons, vascular surgeons, uh, many other uh, specialists who are involved with uh, taking care of uh, advanced peripheral arterial disease. So, let us continue. The objectives of uh, this presentation include clinical assessment of uh, peripheral arterial disease uh, along with uh, epidemiology, diagnostic uh, testing for lower extremity PAD, screening for atherosclerosis in other vascular beds in patients with uh, peripheral arterial disease, uh, medical treatment for patients with uh, peripheral arterial disease, structural exercise therapy which is an important and integral part of managing patients with uh, peripheral arterial disease. Then we are going to focus our attention on minimizing tissue loss in patients with uh, peripheral arterial disease along with uh, various types of revascularization for claudication including endovascular uh, revascularization and surgical revascularization. Then we are going to look at management of a chronic limb ischemia and acute limb ischemia. And finally, we are going to conclude with the longitudinal follow-up of uh, patients with uh, peripheral arterial disease. Prevalence of uh, peripheral arterial disease in the United States. Approximately 8 to 12 million Americans uh, have peripheral arterial disease and by 2050 the prevalence is going to be expected to reaching 19 million people. The incidence of a stroke is uh, about uh, 5.4 million. The coronary heart disease is approximately 13 million and the peripheral arterial disease is very close to the incidence of uh, coronary heart disease. That tells you the extent and the magnitude of the peripheral arterial disease and as we look further we will understand why peripheral arterial disease even though it is less recognized uh, in everyday practice uh, it is something that is going to become a bigger and bigger problem to deal with as the population ages. Talking about aging population, you can see uh, p patients between 50 and 59 years, their incidence of uh, peripheral arterial disease is uh, approximately 10, less than 10 percent of the population and by the time they reach 70 to 80 years, the risk increases to almost 40 percent. That is, in patients who are octogenarians, uh, one out of every two person will have some manifestation of uh, peripheral arterial disease. So, it is exceedingly important for primary care physicians, geriatric physicians uh, they, to pay particular attention to patients uh, at this age group and look for evidence of uh, peripheral arterial disease, look for evidence of uh, chronic limb ischemia and take appropriate measures uh, to minimize the risk of uh, losing an extremity. Again looking at from a different perspective, patients who have diabetes have a four-fold increase in the incidence of peripheral arterial disease and similarly number two risk factor for peripheral arterial disease is smoking. Patients who smoke have 2.5 times the risk of uh, peripheral arterial disease as compared to non-smokers and as you can see total cholesterol has very little effect uh, on the incidence of uh, peripheral arterial disease. This underscores the importance of uh, recognizing diabetes and smoking as the major risk factors uh, for peripheral arterial disease and those with evidence of uh, peripheral arterial disease uh, should be 
strongly advise against smoking and a very strict control of diabetes mellitus becomes the hallmark of managing patients with peripheral arterial disease. Again, here is a composite chart looking at a combination of factors and how they increase the risk of peripheral arterial disease incidence in patients with various manifestations. In red, we have smokers and in yellow bars, we have non-smokers. If we have a patient with a normal systolic blood pressure and a normal cholesterol level and no evidence of glucose intolerance, the incidence of peripheral arterial disease over a period of 8 years is approximately 2.6, which is negligible. However, if we add hypertension, hyperlipidemia and no evidence of diabetes, the risk goes up almost fourfold. But look at here, when we add smoking, hypertension, hyperlipidemia and diabetes, the risk almost goes up uh, close to 18 to 20 times that of the patients uh, who do not have these risk factors. This underscores again the importance of controlling the risk factors in patients with peripheral arterial disease, namely diabetes mellitus and smoking. Typical versus atypical symptoms in patients with uh, peripheral arterial disease. Uh, patients with uh, peripheral arterial disease usually present with uh, the so-called classical symptom of intermittent claudication. That is when they walk, uh, they get cramps in their calf muscles. When they stop, the cramps go away. And this is directly related to a reduced circulation in the extremities which is not able to keep up with the metabolic demands. It is similar to the angina that is experienced in the heart uh, with exertion. The typical symptoms are like the calf pain which I talked about uh, which comes on with walking and is relieved within 10 minutes. But only a third of the patients with the peripheral arterial disease show any evidence of uh, typical intermittent claudication symptoms. So if you are solely relying on the typical intermittent claudication symptoms, we may be missing more than 50% of the patients who present with atypical symptoms which may involve areas other than the calves. And Patient may continue to walk and the symptoms may not resolve within 10 minutes of rest. So there is a whole spectrum of uh, presentation that we need to be aware of when we are dealing with the peripheral arterial disease. It is the presentation, clinical examination combined with the simple basic bedside testings which will steer us in the direction of either peripheral arterial disease or no evidence of peripheral arterial disease. While we are talking about intermittent claudication, we should also mention something about pseudoclaudication. Pseudoclaudication occurs with spinal stenosis compressing on the spinal cord and the lumbar nerves which can produce symptoms similar to claudication in the calf muscles However, they may have normal peripheral arterial studies. When these presents with the normal arterial studies, the next place to look for is to do an MRI of the spine and look for evidence of uh, spinal stenosis compressing the lumbar nerves. Patients with the peripheral arterial disease can also manifest with a variety of uh, cardiovascular events. As a matter of fact, patients who have a history of a peripheral arterial disease uh, have six times greater risk of dying from cardiovascular disease, including myocardial infarction and stroke. The risk of a stroke is increased by two to three fold in patients uh, with the peripheral arterial disease. Similarly, the risk of a fatal myocardial infarction increases by fourfold in patients with PAD and death from all-cause cardiovascular mortalities 
increases by sixfold. So, when we identify patients with the peripheral arterial disease, it is absolutely essential to screen for vascular problems, not only in the legs, but also in the abdomen for triple A, in the carotids for carotid artery disease, or even in the coronaries for evidence of coronary artery disease. Let us talk about history. When we are taking history, we need to go beyond intermittent claudication. We already talked about the claudication. Now, let us look at some of the other important aspects uh, that we need to focus during history taking. Other non-joint related exertional lower extremity symptoms not typical of a claudication may be present. They may also manifest with impaired walking function because of various symptoms and there may be evidence of uh, constant rest ischemia. Physical examination can give a number of clues as to the presence of a peripheral arterial disease along with its uh, complications and manifestations related to poor circulation in the lower extremities. Physical examination, we may find decreased uh, pulses and it is important to monitor blood pressure in both arms. We may hear vascular brewing. We may also see evidence of a non-healing lower extremity wound, ulceration and even osteomyelitis. In extreme cases where there is significantly compromised peripheral arterial circulation, there may be evidence of either dry or wet gangrene and uh, there may also be evidence of uh, pallor and dependent rubber. A couple of words uh, between claudication and pseudoclaudication. Claudication is cramping or tightness or aching felt in mostly in the calf muscles. The location is uh, in the buttock, hip, thigh, calf and foot. Pseudoclaudication, they may be in the same region. Claudication is generally exercise induced whereas pseudoclaudication is variable. It may be related to exertion or it may not be related to exertion. A distance. Patients with a fixed vascular problem in the lower extremities have a consistent distance at which they develop claudication. Whereas in patients with a pseudo claudication, the distance can be variable. Occurs with the standing, it does not occur with standing claudication, whereas pseudo claudication may get worse with standing. Action for relief when patients with uh, intermittent claudication from ischemia. The symptoms get better on standing, whereas uh, pseudoclaudication gets better when the patients are sitting or change position. Generally, the intermittent uh, claudication is relieved in 5 to 10 minutes, whereas uh, pseudoclaudication may last for up to 30 minutes. So, these are some of the main differences between claudication and pseudoclaudication. So it is important you may get a question on either pseudoclaudication or claudication based on their characteristics. Testing. You can do this at bedside in your own office setup on the first visit when the patient comes to you. If this patient has a history of hypertension and diabetes, it is prudent to look for evidence of a peripheral arterial disease. One of the simplest way to look for any evidence of a compromised circulation in the lower extremities is to do an ankle brachial index. Ankle brachial index is simply performed by using a blood pressure cuff and monitoring the systolic blood pressure using a, a Doppler recording that in the arm and also at the ankle level. Then we take the ratio of uh, ankle to brachial pressure. The normal is uh, between 1.0 to 1.4. If the ankle brachial ratio is 0.91 to 0.99, it is considered borderline and anytime the ankle brachial index is less than 0 0.90, it is abnormal. When the ankle brachial ratio is less than 0 0.04, it is considered to represent a severe obstruction in the lower extremity arteries. However, in elderly patients with non-compressible vessels, 
the ankle brachial index may be greater than 1.4 and may pose some confusion in terms of identifying the presence of uh, significant uh, peripheral arterial disease and we will talk about how we can get around this uh, variation. In patients with a borderline ankle brachial index between 0 0.91 to 0.99, a treadmill exercise test can be done and ankle brachial index repeated to look for evidence of uh, ischemia related to exertion. Here is a chart which will help us to triage our patients uh, who present with evidence of a peripheral arterial disease. After careful history and a physical examination, suggestive of peripheral arterial disease without any evidence of rest pain, they undergo ankle brachial index study. If, if we are dealing with a non-compressible arteries, which I talked about in the elderly population, and if the ankle brachial index is greater than 1.4, they undergo exercise brachial index and if it is greater than 470 it is normal and we look for any other evidence for claudication in these patients. However, after exercise if the brachial ankle brachial ratio is less than 0 0.70 we look at life limiting claudication despite medical treatment. These patients should be undergoing further diagnostic tests including duplex scan of the lower extremities or CT angiography or MRA and then they must be categorized based on the anatomic location of the obstructions into appropriate treatments. Here they talk about uh, duplex scan and CTA which I just mentioned. Then based on that invasive angiography may be indicated if there are critical lesions during which time endovascular procedures can be performed to improve the circulation. If there is no evidence of a significant blockage on these uh, non-invasive studies, uh, these patients uh, can be continued on medical treatment. On the other hand, if we have a normal ABI between 1.0 and 1.40, they need we need to look for other causes of uh, pain in the lower extremities. If it is borderline, we look for exertional non-joint related leg symptoms. If the exercise ABI is abnormal, we follow this pathway. If the exercise ABI is normal, then we look for other evidences uh, such as uh, neurological or spinal problems. Finally, if the person has an abnormal ABI that is less than 0.9, they undergo diagnostic tests such as the duplex ultrasound or CTA or MRA and based on these findings, they are going to be categorized to medical or endovascular procedures. Here is an example of a duplex ultrasound of the lower extremities. This is how we record the duplex scan of the femoral, the popliteal and the tibial arteries below the knee and this is the ultrasound picture showing the arterial lumen filled with blood and here we have the, the pulse wave which is triphasic which is supposed to be normal or a sort of a monophasic wave with high velocities suggesting significant uh, obstruction at any given site. And here you also can see instead of seeing a smooth red uh, column of blood, we see a mosaic pattern with uh, distortion and narrowing along with uh, this uh, pulse Doppler which shows significantly elevated velocity of uh, 6 meters per second suggesting a highly critical lesion in this segment of the uh, artery in the lower extremity. Here is a CT angiography of the lower extremities. There is extensive calcification in the iliac arteries and here we have the femoral arteries which also show calcification and here we see a critical stenosis in the left femoral artery in this particular image and similarly we have uh, an obstruction here and we can see lower down the arterial lumen looks uh, significantly impaired. So, this is a patient uh, with a significant uh, peripheral arterial disease. In the first image, we can see the right side appears to be okay until it reaches the knee level, 
but on the left side there is almost total abstraction just at the iliac level and there is some reconstitution here in the middle of the left thigh. So, CT angiography is exceedingly useful in diagnosing the presence and the location and the severity of uh, lesions in patients with uh, peripheral arterial disease. Similarly, MRA is also an extremely important tool in diagnosing the presence of a peripheral arterial disease. With a single study, we can do the MRA of the abdomen and the lower extremities all together. And here you can see this patient has total occlusion of the abdominal aorta. There is some evidence of an old stent in the lower part of the abdominal aorta on both the right and the left iliac arteries and again we see total occlusion beyond the stent and there is a total occlusion here in the left uh, femoral artery. So, these will tell us not only where the lesion is and how significant the lesion is and also the status of the arteries beyond the blockage which will help us to formulate uh, whether we need to proceed with uh, endovascular revascularization or consider bypass surgery based on the anatomy and uh, the nature of the lesion and the arteries beyond the blockage. Now, let us talk about medical management of uh, patients with uh, PAD. The drugs which we are going to be talking about include antiplatelet agents, statins and a strict control of uh, hypertension along with anticoagulations if and when necessary. Now, we are going to look at some of the ACC AHA guidelines when it comes to recommendation of drugs in patients with peripheral arterial disease. Uh, class 1 indication is to use an antiplatelet therapy with aspirin alone 75 to 325 milligrams per day or use clopidogrel alone 75 milligrams daily in patients with symptomatic peripheral arterial disease. In asymptomatic patients with peripheral arterial disease uh, with an ABI of less than 0 0.90, antiplatelet therapy is reasonable to reduce the risk of uh, myocardial infarction, stroke or vascular death. However, if you have an asymptomatic patient with borderline ABI, it is uncertain whether antiplatelet agents would reduce these uh, endpoints such as myocardial infarction, stroke or vascular death. Antiplatelet agents. The effectiveness of a dual antiplatelet therapy such as aspirin and clopidogrel to reduce the risk of a cardiovascular ischemic events in patients with symptomatic PAD is not well established. So, let us analyze this for a moment. If you are purely treating a patient with peripheral arterial disease, the role of dual antiplatelet agent is not well established. As you know, in cardiac patients, we routinely use dual antiplatelet agents uh, such as aspirin and uh, clopidogrel for those patients who have significant vascular disease and diabetes or those who have had stent placement. But in patients with peripheral arterial disease, the dual antiplatelet agents have not shown to be effective. Dual antiplatelet therapy using aspirin and Plavix may be reasonable to reduce the risk of limb ischemia related events in patients with symptomatic peripheral arterial disease after revascularization. So, this is an important point we need to keep in mind. If a patient has a peripheral arterial disease and if the patient undergoes uh, endovascular stent placement or if the patient has uh, aortofemoral bypass or uh, fempopliteal bypass, then it is reasonable to treat these patients with dual antiplatelet agents. So, please remember these differences. Now, let us move on to statins. Treatment with the statin medication is indicated for all patients with the peripheral arterial disease. If you are dealing with a young person with a peripheral arterial disease who has no other indications for statins like coronary artery disease or diabetes, but just peripheral arterial disease, then it is appropriate to put these patients on statins uh, as uh, indicated in this uh, 
recommendation. Let us continue with the AACC, AHA, PDA guidelines, uh, anti-hypertensive agents. This is a given. Any patient with hypertension and peripheral arterial disease must be aggressively treated with antihypertensive agents to reduce the blood pressure and also reduce the risk of uh, MI, stroke and heart failure. And it has also been shown that patients uh, should be treated with angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker in reducing the risk of uh, cardiovascular ischemic events in patients with peripheral arterial disease. Now, let us talk about oral anticoagulation. The usefulness of uh, anticoagulation to improve patency after lower extremity autogenous vein or prosthetic bypass is uncertain. That is, if a patient has undergone aortofemoral or fempopliteal bypass using an autogenous vein or a prosthetic bypass, there is no data to suggest that anticoagulation is going to help these patients. Similarly, anticoagulation should not be used to reduce the risk of uh, cardiovascular ischemic events uh, in patients with uh, peripheral arterial disease. Smoking cessation. If there is one thing that you want to take home as a message in this uh, presentation on ACC AHA PDA guidelines, uh, it is smoking cessation. It does not matter how much we diagnose the presence of a peripheral arterial disease in these patients. It does not matter how aggressive we are in treating their vascular lesions with endovascular procedures, bypass surgery and anything else you can think of. If we do not recommend a smoking cessation and if the patient continues to smoke, all these exercises are going to be in futility because these patients are going to keep coming back with recurrent stenosis like a revolving door. They get the procedure, they go home, three months later they are going to be back again and it is absolutely essential on the part of the physician, the internist, the cardiologist and the endovascular, endovascular or vascular surgeons to emphasize the importance of a smoking cessation. If they are not able to stop smoking, we should help them with uh, pharmacotherapy such as uh, vernicline, bupropion or nicotine replacement therapy. All these uh, patients should be referred to the American Lung Association smoking cessation, acupuncture or anything else you can think of to make sure these patients stop smoking. Patients with peripheral arterial sh disease should also make every effort to avoid secondhand smoke at work, at home and in public places. Glycemic control. Now we are talking about diabetes. As I showed you earlier, diabetes increases the risk of uh, peripheral arterial disease by 4.5 fold. So it makes sense to control diabetes. With much better control of diabetes, we have a much better chance of the risk of uh, atherosclerosis involving the peripheral arteries. Management of uh, diabetes mellitus in patients with uh, peripheral arterial disease should be coordinated between the members of the healthcare team and the patient. Glycemic control can be beneficial in patients with chronic limb ischemia to reduce limb related outcomes. You may want to underscore this because this may be an important point that we want to emphasize to patients with the chronic leg ischemia where control of diabetes can mean salvaging their limbs, improving the circulation in those compromised legs. Now let us talk about some of the drugs that are used for symptomatic relief. Among them are Celestazole, pentoxifiline and chelation therapy. Celestazole has been around for a while and it has been shown to improve symptoms and walking distance in patients with intermittent claudication. One contraindication we need to remember is uh, celestazole should not be used in patients with uh, evidence of a congestive heart failure. Next, pentoxifiline is not effective in treatment of claudication. Similarly, the chelation therapy that is uh, ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid or EDTA has not shown to be beneficial in treatment 
of patients with intermittent claudication. Homocysteine has also not been shown to be improving symptoms in patients with uh, peripheral arterial disease. Hence, homocysteine is not recommended for patients with peripheral arterial disease. Patients with peripheral arterial disease should routinely receive influenza vaccination. Let's talk about uh, the structured exercise program. All patients with peripheral arterial disease should be enrolled in a structured exercise program which involves supervised exercise program with walking 30 to 40 minutes per day for at least three to four times a week. And as you can see, those patients who are involved in a structured exercise program can almost double their walking distance six minute walking distance with exercise rehabilitation. This is the exercise training program and this is the control group. The onset of symptoms and maximal claudication pain. So there is a dramatic improvement in the distance these people are able to walk and also reduce the symptoms of intermittent claudication. Every patient with a documented history of a peripheral arterial disease must be enrolled in a supervised exercise program and once they have gone through a program they need to continue this exercise program lifelong. Minimizing tissue loss in patients with peripheral arterial disease. One of the saddest things about peripheral arterial disease is uh, its progressive nature and also its devastating effect on the lower extremities. That's why minimizing tissue loss should be of high priority in patients with peripheral arterial disease, especially those who have a history of diabetes mellitus or who have a history of smoking. Minimizing tissue loss in patients with peripheral arterial disease. Patients with peripheral arterial disease and diabetes mellitus should be counseled about self foot examination and healthy foot behaviors. They should be advised to minimize any trauma to their leg. If they have any skin aberration, discoloration, redness, or any evidence of uh, skin change, they should immediately contact their physician and get thorough examination to determine if there is a worsening of their peripheral arterial disease and if there is compromised circulation in that uh, extremity. Again, in patients uh, with uh, PAD, prompt diagnosis and treatment of uh, foot infections are recommended to avoid amputation, especially in patients with diabetes mellitus. As I mentioned earlier, these patients uh, can develop ulcerations which are extremely hard in terms of healing and the ulcerations can penetrate deep into the bones and patients can quickly end up with osteomyelitis. So these symptoms must be addressed right at their origin. In patients with peripheral arterial disease and signs of a foot infection, prompt referral to an interdisciplinary care team can be beneficial. Management of uh, ischemic leg is not a one person's job. It involves multiple specialties, which we are going to look at in a minute. And every person involved in the team must be conscious of what this patient's uh, circulation is and what the prognosis is and how to minimize further compromise of circulation and how to minimize any further complications. And here is a list of uh, interdisciplinary specialists who will be involved in taking care of uh, patients with uh, peripheral arterial disease with uh, significantly compromised circulation to their lower extremities. It involves a uh, vascular surgeon, a va interventional radiologists, interventional cardiologists, nurses, orthopedic surgeons, endocrinologists, internal medicine specialists, infection specialists, especially if there is evidence of osteomyelitis. Then we have radiology and vascular imaging specialists, physical medicine, orthopedic surgery, social worker, exercise physiologists, and the list goes on and on, including nutritionists and dietitians. Revascularization for claudication. Okay, we have taken every step to minimize the progression of coronary atherosclerosis 
but the patient has diabetes and the patient continues to smoke, which compromises the circulation. When there is significant re reduction in the circulation, then we are going to lead with claudication, ulceration, gangrene and how do we deal with these situations. Revascularization is a reasonable treatment option for patients with life limiting claudication with an inadequate response to guidelines directed medical therapy. Endovascular revascularization for claudication. Endovascular procedures are effective as a revascularization option for patients with uh, lifestyle limiting claudication and hemodynamically significant uh, aortoiliac occlusive disease. Similarly, they may also be helpful in patients with uh, femoropopliteal disease. However, the endovascular revascularization may not be useful in patients uh, with uh, vascular disease below the knee. Endovascular procedures should not be performed in patients with peripheral arterial disease solely to prevent progression of a chronic limb ischemia. That is a contraindication. Now, here are some examples of patients undergoing endovascular revascularization. As you can see, here is a, a femoral artery which is totally blocked off which has been opened up with a guide wire and a stent left in place with the complete opening of the artery. Similarly, here we have a total occlusion of the main femoral artery with a side branch coming off here and this is a side branch here with the advancement of the guide wire and cleaning up of the clot and placement of a stent. Here we have a final result which shows good revascularization of a totally occluded right femoral artery. Endovascular revascularization can also be considered for patients with the abdominal aortic aneurysm using a, a composite graft which excludes the abdominal aorta and redirects the blood from the aorta above the aneurysm into the iliac trunks through these uh, side grafts. We may have something that supplies both iliacs or we can just have one graft coming into one iliac artery and then we can do an iliac to iliac bypass to improve the circulation on the other side. If we are primarily dealing with a triple A, just a aortic uh, exclusion graft can be introduced through the endovascular approach. Here is an example of an aortic aneurysm which is involving the lower part of the abdominal aorta along with iliacs and here is a composite graft which is uh, uh, introduced in place and as you can see the graft extends into both the left and the right iliac arteries. Here is an example of a procedure performed in the lower extremity with a total occlusion of uh, one of the branches uh, here, peroneal branch, but uh, even though it looks like a good result, the long term prognosis in these patients is going to be quite limited. These patients will be coming back with uh, symptoms sooner or later. Management of uh, chronic limb ischemia. Chronic limb ischemia definition. A condition characterized by chronic that means more than two weeks of ischemic rest pain. Make a note ischemic rest pain, non-healing wound or ulcer or gangrene in one or both legs attributable to objectively proven arterial occlusive disease. The diagnosis of a chronic limb ischemia is similar to the ones which we have already talked about which includes first the ankle brachial index followed by a duplex scan and CT angiography or MRA. Based on these uh, studies a decision can be made as to how these patients are going to be treated revascularization for chronic limb ischemia. In patients with chronic limb ischemia, revascularization should be performed when possible to minimize tissue loss. An evaluation uh, for revascularization options should be performed by 
an interdisciplinary care team before any amputation is recommended for patients with uh, chronic limb ischemia. Endovascular revascularization is uh, a reasonable choice for patients with a chronic limb ischemia who show evidence of a non-healing wound or gangrene. It is also useful in patients with ischemic rest pain. Angiosome directed endovascular therapy may be reasonable for patients with chronic limb ischemia and non-healing wound or gangrene. Surgical revascularization. When do we consider surgical revascularization for patients with chronic limb ischemia? When surgery is performed for chronic limb ischemia, bypass to the popliteal or the infrapopliteal arteries should be constructed using suitable tortuous vein. It is very important to stress this point that uh, if we use a synthetic graft, the chances of the graft staying open are very limited. Surgical procedures are recommended to establish inline blood flow to the foot in patients with non-healing wounds or gangrene. In patients with a chronic limb ischemia for whom endovascular revascularization has failed and a suitable autogenous vein is not available, a prosthetic material can be effective for bypass to below knee popliteal and tibial arteries with the hope of salvaging the limb and preventing any further gangrene. Now let us talk about wound healing therapies for chronic limb ischemia. An interdisciplinary care team should evaluate and provide comprehensive care for patients with a chronic limb ischemia and tissue loss to achieve complete wound healing and functional foot. In patients with chronic limb ischemia, wound care after revascularization should be performed with the goal of a complete wound healing. So just simple revascularization is not going to cut it. We have to continue with the aggressive medical management of underlying medical conditions and also take appropriate steps for wound healing and preservation of uh, foot. In patients with a chronic limb ischemia, intermittent pneumatic compression arterial pump devices may be considered to augment wound healing and or ameliorate uh, severe ischemic rest pain. Effectiveness of the hyperbaric oxygen therapy for wound healing has not been established. Prostonoids are not indicated in patients with uh, chronic limb ischemia. Now let us talk about management of acute limb ischemia. The definition of acute limb ischemia includes acute that is less than 2 weeks, severe hypoperfusion of the limb characterized by pain, pallor, pulselessness, piculothermia that is cold, climy extremities paresthesia and paralysis. If you haven't noticed it, all of them start with P. Let's repeat it again. Pain, pallor, pulselessness, pyclothermia, paresthesia and paralysis. You got it. There are three varieties. The first variety is the less severe one where the tissues underlying the skin are viable such as muscles, nerves, whereas the second one is a little more advanced with the threatened muscle function, loss of sensation along with inaudible dopplers. Irreversible is the, the worst kind where there is permanent damage to the nerves, to the muscles and loss of sensation. So this is uh, almost like dry gangrene. Clinical presentation of acute limb ischemia. Patients with uh, acute limb ischemia should be emergently evaluated by a clinician with sufficient experience to assess limb viability and implement appropriate therapy. So this becomes a medical emergency. So if you are a primary care doctor or a cardiologist so seeing this type of a patient in your office, the best thing to do would be to refer them to the emergency room where further testings uh, such as ultrasound, duplex scan or a CT angiography can be done to determine the degree of a peripheral vascular disease and implement appropriate treatment as soon as possible. 
possible. Similarly, in patients with the suspected acute limb ischemia, initial evaluation should rapidly assess limb viability and potential for salvage. So, if you have a suspected patient, they should be evaluated for limb viability. If there is evidence of limb viability, you have some time to further evaluate this patient. Evaluation of uh, the cause of acute limb ischemia. Acute limb ischemia can be either related to thrombosis or embolization. So, it is very important to look for evidence of uh, thrombi or emboli coming from other sources other than the extremity itself and the major culprit of course, you know is a clot coming from the heart chambers, especially in patients with the pre-existing atrial fibrillation. Medical therapy for acute limb ischemia. All patients with acute limb ischemia or evidence of acute limb ischemia must be started on anticoagulation with heparin as soon as the diagnosis is made. Now, let us look at uh, the protocol that will help us to determine what is the right treatment. On this side, we have slight discoloration of the skin, but the color appears to be okay, whereas on this side, we have a dead great toe and second toe. Diagnosis and management of acute limb ischemia. Acutely cold and painful leg, suspected of uh, acute limb ischemia. Clinical evaluation including symptoms, motor and sensory function assessment, arterial and venous Doppler signals are measured. If we have an audible arterial and visible venous pulsation, we are dealing with category 1 limb ischemia, normal motor function, no sensory loss, uh, intact capillary filling and these patients uh, can undergo urgent revascularization, anticoagulation unless there is contraindication with the hope of salvaging the extremity. The second class is arterial pulses are inaudible, venous inaudible arterial pulses, audible venous pulses, motor function assessment. We will look into that in a moment in the next slide. Here we have inaudible arterial pulses, inaudible venous pulses, uh, complete loss of motor function, complete loss of sensory function, complete loss of uh, capillary refill. We are dealing with a dry gangrene. These patients uh, should be classified for a primary amputation. Now, let us continue with this the middle segment. Now, we are continuing with the middle segment based on the motor function assessment. If the motor function is intact, then we look for marginally threatened slow to slow capillary refill, sensory loss limited to toe if present, uh, no muscular weakness. These uh, patients may be salvageable if therapy is implemented promptly using revascularization and anticoagulation. Whereas, if there is impairment of the motor function, we are dealing with an intermediate uh, threat and these patients uh, again should be evaluated by angiography and treated with revascularization or anticoagulation therapy. So, this is how we deal with a patient with the acute limb ischemia. To me, this is a, an urgent medical problem. The patient should be immediately admitted to the hospital and appropriate tests done first to determine the circulation. Next, look for motor function. Number three, sensory function and evidence of gangrene. Based on that, appropriate uh, steps should be taken. Revascularization for all acute limb ischemia. In patients with acute limb ischemia, the revascularization strategy should be determined by local resources and patient factors, that is the etiology, degree of ischemia, etc. Catheter-based thrombolysis is effective in certain patients with acute limb ischemia and it may help us to salvage the limb. Amputation should be performed as a first procedure in patients with non-salvageable limb with evidence of gangrene and with evidence of uh, rapidly spreading infection. Patients with uh, acute limb ischemia should be monitored and treated using fasciotomy for compartment syndromes after revascularization. Revascularization for limb ischemia continued. 
in patients with all acute limb ischemia with a salvageable limb percutaneous mechanical thrombectomy may also be attempted as an adjunct therapy to thrombolyze in patients with acute limb ischemia due to embolism and with salvageable limb should undergo surgical thromboembolectomy whenever it is possible the usefulness of ultrasound accelerated catheter based thrombolysis for patients with acute limb ischemia with salvageable limb is unknown longitudinal follow up all patients with the peripheral arterial disease must be followed by the primary care doctor their endovascular uh, specialist cardiovascular surgeon cardiologist and they should have a periodic evaluation they should undergo repeat uh, ultrasound duplex uh, studies to look for any evidence of a progression of the disease and we should also address their structured exercise program while at the same time looking for any evidence of uh, re reduced circulation in the lower extremities at each visit to a doctor's uh, hospital how does endovascular revascularization compare to that of bypass surgery here are some comparisons of aortoiliac disease treated with aortofemoral bypass versus percutaneous endovascular intervention the patency rate at 5 years among patients who go aortofemoral bypass is at the range of 80 to 85% compared to 65 to 80% in patients undergoing endovascular revascularization perioperative mortality of course is 5 to 8% in surgical patients compared to 0.1% which is a major advantage for patients undergoing percutaneous intervention reserved for severe diffuse disease cases and this could be a treatment of choice in simple straightforward cases and also patients with total occlusion who can be reasonably treated with uh, percutaneous intervention this is indicated for patients with rutherford class greater than 3 whereas endovascular interventions are indicated for patients with rutherford classification greater than 2 so ladies and gentlemen so ladies and gentlemen this is a comprehensive review of uh, management of uh, patients with the peripheral arterial disease including acc aha pda guidelines 2016 I am Dr. Nick Nickum. I am a cardiologist. Thank you very much for watching this video and please please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and if you would like us to prepare a presentation on any other guidelines for cardiovascular problems please leave us some comments below and we will see you next time. Thank you so much for your time. I am Dr. Nick Nickum.